Howdy folks. We'll get started at five after about four minutes. Please add your name and any top agenda topic to the meeting notes. Which is posted in the Zoom chat as well as in the CNCF Slack. Hey folks uh, that have joined, just joined, we'll get started in about two minutes at five after. All right, it's five after. Posted the meeting notes again in the Zoom chat. Please add your name and any agenda topic that you'd like to discuss. Um, right now it's kind of blank unless we get into the pull request, which is fine. Um, we've been trying to leave it open to have some more discussions on use cases or anything other topic that someone had. So is there any walk-in topics before we jump into any of the pull requests or anything else? Uh, can I ask a question maybe about the agenda? Um, 
Does it look like we've really covered all the all the bureaucratic issues with voting and everything? Uh, I kind of wanted wanted to leave the agenda open to uh, to finish all that stuff so we can uh, dig deeper. What does everybody think? <laughs> so, um, yeah, good. I guess question comment Tal. So we put most of those administrative governance items towards the end. Um, a lot of them are the recurring so that we could have more time to dive in immediately to talk about use cases and other things. Um, and then we can cover those if um, the, the governance items that are currently open at, towards the end, that's how we put it in here because they were taking up so much uh, time ever every time and some of them needed a lot more discussion. So rather than rush them, we were allowing them to uh, be at the end. But those are there. And if, if we don't have anything else discussed, then we can get into this. Okay, I think I'm, I'm not quite ready uh, today, but I will try for next week maybe to create an agenda item uh, that can move us forward a bit on the networking orchestration front. Sounds good. Yeah, and if, if there's any um, specific part of that that can be talked about, um, if you're not ready with a whole lot of the pieces, then we can focus on a, one particular area. I know when we had our um, call breaking it down, there was a lot of different topics that could be discussed. Huh? So I was actually kind of hoping we, we, I mean, we don't have to specifically get into the nuts and bolts of orchestration itself, but like, I'd like to, I'd like at least half of this call to not be about bureaucracy if possible. Um, I'd like to discuss Vuk's use case. Um, he's not on yet though, so maybe we do that one second. Um, personally, I think he's got multiple use cases wrapped up into his first PR. Um, and kind of like to discuss as a group on like, maybe we spawn other use cases out of it. Um, there's the concept of like, you know, immutable infrastructure in lifecycle management of infrastructure, which I think is the core of his use case. And then like what we think that means from a CNF standpoint, but then he's got things around testing in there. He's got some DevOpsy stuff in there about like, what does it mean between the different actors we identified at the beginning? Um, and in addition to that, um, I, I see a on here. Um, we've got Tal, Nikolai, some other like network savvy people. I'd like to talk about, um, that discussion and maybe this kind of would lead into what your follow-up agenda item is next week, Tal, around um, external network orchestration. Um, I, I think um, like just reading through the comments, some of my comments and stuff, like there is a lot of um, assumptions that I think all of us make. And I don't think we tend to make the same assumptions all the time on like what an existing network is, you know, do I require an L2 domain for something like, there's just all these things where I feel like um, it'd be loud to talk to some of the points in there. Um, so that way we can kind of, in our minds, collectively kind of get on the same page. I don't know if people agree with that or not, like that course of action, but I think it would be useful. Uh, so I, I added a link in the chat to that, uh, to that discussion because I imagine not everybody was following it. So. Um... There's a lot there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of off the cuff here, but yeah, if, if Jeffrey, if you want to present it in some way that we can discuss it, I think that could be good. Yeah, and I, I think it's gonna be a, um, a multiple discussion type talk. So first, um, Bill Taylor, before I hijack things, is there anything you guys want to you know, touch first before we dive down this rabbit hole? I'm happy to go into whatever everyone's wanting to discuss. Um, I agree with you on on um, having a smaller focus on the governance items. So we have those at the end. If we get to them, great. And if we don't today, then that's okay. Cool. Okay, so yeah, for general context, Alok put up a, this concept, you know, this, potential use case for 
Kubernetes extent, external network orchestration. Um, goes into some specifics on like some of the things that he's looking for. There's talks about how we attach network interfaces. Um, Gergay goes into some of the encapsulation techniques. We start talking about dynamic network management. Um, to, to start though, I want to um, just pose a question. Is um, should Kate be orchestrating networks external to itself? Um, and so for some clarity, and, and I, I'm not like putting an opinion here. I just want us to think about this, right? Because we start talking about network attachments. In fact, Tal, I think you're the one who um, covers that somewhere down here in the comments. Um, but like, there's the overlay networking case that we all know. We all know that we have to deal with the single interface um, with pods. We know that we have to deal with, you know, natting out of now taking on the um, source IP of the host that's, you know, hosting the pods. There's like all these quirks, right? And then there's this concept of like the network that sits outside of that overlay that we're attaching to. Can I attach to multiple networks? Um, so just first question I'd like to like propose, and maybe there's multiple answers is like, what is the thought on like, um, should Kate be continuing to take on more and more and more? We think, you know, this is kind of in my mind, similar to like Qbert where I want Kate to orchestrate like lifecycle management of VMs. What are people's thoughts on like Kate's itself, you know, building networks external to the overlay network or potentially doing something where like you peer with the underlay, like some type of like bird implementation or something and you blur the lines of what that overlay network and the underlay network look like to begin with. So, uh, uh, book is speaking a uh, short, uh, I, I came with a little bit delay. Um, th that's actually very interesting. Uh, topic and uh, I, I feel it's something we need to explore but uh, on the other side it reminds me actually on uh, on a two attempts in a similar direction that uh, are yeah attempted to, to, to be done on a CNI level so we, we have a tungsten fabric or this uh, junipers uh, uh, CNI and uh, we have a Cisco ACI CNI which um, actually take a role of something that speaks to an SDN layer and then in a in a way orchestrating the network but here I think uh, Jeffrey you are talking about uh, capability outside of the of the CNI or did I get it uh, right or wrong no, I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely on the right track. Um, like, same thing with like, you know, the Neutron plugins and stuff, right? Like I can get like this really, you know, nifty coupling between whatever my SDN abstraction is. Um, but my question, you know, then like you said, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate, posing questions to kind of what the group thinks is like, uh, if I want to run bare metal, um, you know, what does that look like? Do I start looking for southbound adapters into like my top of rack switches to dynamically provision these networks. I mean, I'm just kind of curious, like where people think the line is for what Kate should and shouldn't be doing when it comes to network orchestration. Um, so yeah. maybe that I'll, I'll try maybe to break down a, a, a three aspect. Well, I'll limit it to two, not to take too much time, but uh, trying to understand what is external really. I think that's one of those assumptions, Jeffrey, that you mentioned that people make. Um, what is external and what is internal to, to the CNF, right? Where, where is that line drawn exactly? Um, a lot of times, you know, to deploy something, you do need to configure, for example, a data center switch, like a top of the rack switch that's sitting there. So is that really external or you can think of it as a shared <laughs> a resource? Um, the, the other thing, you know, uh, Jeffrey, you're talking about should Kubernetes orchestrate it? Well. What is Kubernetes here, right? Because if we're talking about the workload running on Kubernetes, right? If, if you're running, say, an, a Kubernetes operator or some kind of controller or something else that will, say, talk to the switch or talk to an SDN controller or, you know, talk to a network acceleration switch sitting inside the hardware, right? Um, are those really external? <laughs> and, you know, which parts of Kubernetes will really do that? So, um, I think rather than talking about should Kubernetes do that, we should say, should the network function do that? What is the scope of the network function? Where do we draw the line and say, this is something external to it? 
I think it's pretty fuzzy. I, I think Kubernetes role in this is very is very clear and specific. It farms it out to CNI and uh, it doesn't, as long as you give it an IP address, it doesn't really care what you do. And there are mechanisms in place that we can, that we can control or modify the, the pod. But in, in general, it, Kubernetes is very unopinionated about this particular space. Okay, but here's here's where it gets complicated because the CNI plugin, you can say, okay, that's out of my domain, it just runs. But what if your workload needs to interact with that plugin, right? If that plugin is, is what we sometimes call a thick plugin, that is it's a service that's actually running and doing things, you your workload might have to have something to do with that configuration. And I, I extended oh, I, I, that in the discussion to talk about infrastructure in general, right? Because sometimes you might even need to configure the, the host machine, the bare metal itself. But yeah, I, having I, something I, to I say this. about the configuration and doing the configuration are two very different things, right? Having something to say in, you know, in so much as that the CNF exposes some requirement northbound is very different than the CNF doing the work itself. Yeah. and and. That, that's what I was saying. From an orchestrator, it's clear that the or, that something has to orchestrate in this in this scenario. I, should that be Kubernetes? I don't think it should be, but it should interact with Kubernetes in 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 a clearer way. Uh, is, is is what I'm trying to say. Like, but saying Kubernetes itself as the as the orchestrator should it be the thing. There there needs to be something that does orchestrate it, but it probably should not be Kubernetes itself because Kubernetes is is very unopinionated about the, about this kind of work. Right, and probably not Kubernetes itself, but yeah, possibly I don't think a you, workload running in Kubernetes. Right, I don't think you Kubernetes want the software. CNF itself doing it either because the the goal should be to only have one thing actually making configuration changes on those on those switches, for example, right? And if you allow the CNF to make changes in the switch and you have a northbound orchestrator making changes in the switch because of physical changes in the topology of the network, you now have too many actors making changes to the same resource, right? The goal should be to have one actor making changes to a resource, not multiples. Absolutely yeah, right. That's, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's very similar to, to what I had posted before in the, X, uh, in the X Factor CNF stuff, which is that the CNF is not the one making those decisions, but instead is orchestrated. And what it has to do in, in that framework is it has to provide metadata such as what is my payload? Like payload could be ethernet, IP, uh, VXLAN or something else. And what is my mechanism to actually communicate with the outside world where the mechanism could be kernel interface, VFIO, MEMIF, uh, something else. And so what you do is you provide enough information to the orchestrator so, you, so it under, understands and says, oh, I'm, I need to wire you up. Um, it, helps, it helps with like, you don't want to pair up an IP with an ethernet as an example, because then there's a mismatch. Uh, you don't want to pair up a, a, a VFIO uh, user plane with a MEMIF, or sorry, VFIO client with a, with a MEMIF uh, server or, or receiver because then you know it's not gonna work. So you have, it gives you that, the, or the orchestrator, the thing that's actually doing the orchestration, whether it's an SDN or something else, the capability to, uh, to check across all, all of these particular paths. So yeah. there, clear there, it's clear that there's a, a need for orchestrator here. The CNF probably should not be that thing itself, but it, it certainly needs to interact with it. Unless it's a purpose-built CNF that's job is orchestration. Yeah, I, I can I can buy that. Yeah, and that we call up. I'd like to right. So, so to say. So well, yeah. it, it, it depends it's, though a little, good. right? Like yeah, that just so that's one of the things I think. Like I so a couple of things for one operators. That's an implementation to get mm -hmm. functionality, right? So yeah. um, I'd like I'd like us to first continue to like identify our challenges here, right? Like I would propose. Yeah. And I'm actually going to stitch in Volk's use case here, right? Volk's use case um, is the concept of operational lifecycle management of the infrastructure, right? When we we always get right into like the low-level plumbing of like how am I, you know, getting these two pods to talk to each other? Is it MIMIF? Is you know there's some kind of kernel interface involved? This and that, but you know I would just pose that like if you're dealing with like cloud-native infrastructure in addition to cloud-native workloads, then the assumption is is um, and actually let me bring that up real quick too is this concept of um 
you know, the infrastructure itself has a say yeah. in this. So from my, my so perspective, like in my, in my, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say just what, so like the final point on this, right. Is if I have some type of, um, you know, pipeline that's involved for like building out these, um, this infrastructure, right. Like I'm using things like node labels. I'm using, you know, specialty compute for where it makes sense. I mean, cause do I put an FPGA in every single like, you know, I don't know, maybe the cost eventually gets to that point, or do I use, you know, concepts like availability zones, labels, tags, et cetera. So, I mean, like I said, uh, we always come in with these assumptions and I would, you know, propose, like, I like Tal's, um, you know, comment that it's a shared network potentially or whatever, because um, like a lot of times this infrastructure already exists. And like, I can tell you from personal experience, some of the challenges I have is, okay, we're going to bring Kate's in and now Kate's wants to control the world versus, you know, Kate's, providing an interface for managing containers, pods, et cetera. Um, you know, what would the CNF interface look like? Like with the assumption that I'm not just handing over all of my infrastructure, because I would say that if we just like hand control to the CNF or case itself, then at that point I'm building an appliance, which then we could argue and debate and maybe write a best, you know, practice that's saying an appliance based approach is the right approach. I don't know. But like, the moment you just start handing everything over and pulling control as Shane was talking about from like these other domain controllers that are specific to infrastructure that are in doing it, we start either having a multiple master scenario where things get lost, we have state drift, or we start building purpose-built appliances. And, you know, those are the types of things I think we should be considering when we start like talking about how we would tackle this use case that you put in uh, discussions. Yeah. And for some use cases, that purpose-built appliance may be the right uh, solution, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right solution for every use case. Yeah, and, and I think the, the framework that we should aim for from best practices uh, is something that should be flexible in that respect. Um, and it, it acknowledges, ideally would acknowledge that Kubernetes is very good at a very specific thing, which is it's good at orchestrating where pods should, uh, should run. Uh, if it's good at, at monitoring them, restarting them, uh, canary upgrades and, and so on, which provide a tremendous amount of functionality. Uh, but it's, it, it has some, some gaps that need to be covered. And the reality of the situation is that if you look at the size, like when we, when we look at telecom, uh, we, we can say, yeah, we're, we're, we're a big group. We're a big organization with, uh, with some money behind us. But when you compare it to the long tail of Kubernetes, we're, we're a small fish in the, in the pond and they're not gonna to want to complicate Kubernetes to cover our use cases when the common use case of Kubernetes is a, is a small to medium sized cluster with very simple patterns. And so we need to be a little bit careful there. Uh, we have room to play, uh, but we, we need to have, we, we need to make sure that we are not over complicating the enterprise side while we do this, because otherwise we'll get a tremendous quantity of pushback and not get through the things that we, uh, that we need when, when there is a gap that Kubernetes seriously does need to, to resolve. So we want to be careful on what type of things that we, we bubble up as, as, as that process, which uh, the mindset that we take into this will, will matter a lot. Another way to, um, or to add on to that, Frederick, is if we can break down use cases and find areas that are most aligned with um, the path that Kubernetes is already on, then it's more likely those will be adopted. And if we can get momentum with that, then you're going to have more people from the different communities looking and understanding what's going on. And then I think we can get more adoption across on other things. I mean, th there mm -hmm. is, as you know, Frederick, there's, there's a lot of activity on the networking side itself, but it's not a easy fix to, to try to solve for all of the community. And, and here's, a, here's a question. If, um, if I were to implement uh, some form of controller or orchestrator that interacts with a CNF and, uh, or rather interacts with, a, with some data plane, something that sits on the data plane, 
So this thing, let's say it's a database. So very often we have OVSDB or similar, but at the end of the day, I would argue that those are applications which, uh, at, they're, they're applications in, in, in Kubernetes. So uh, there's, there's not a huge difference between something like OVSDB versus something like Postgres uh, when, from the concept of, of Kubernetes itself and that there's no special types of, of network links you need to put in that Kubernetes cannot handle today as part of its, uh, as part of its path. And so there's, I think we, we also need to, uh, to highlight some of the best practices around that space is like, when is something just an application? And yes, it may be part of a, of a CNF or it may be part of a, uh, it may be composed with, uh, with things that touch the data plane, but at the same time, is there, is there anything missing? Is there anything special that these type of things need? And I suspect that there's not anything special that we have what we need today. And uh, then that allows us to scope down the, the changes to say, hey, we're, here's best practice on how, like if you're deploying OVSDB, here's best practices to make sure that it's high availability within Kubernetes, like that's valuable. But then when you start looking at things like how do I actually touch the data plane and uh, do bump in the wire firewall or set up a, a 5G packet core or similar, then what are the best practices when you start to get patterns that look like that for things that actually have to touch the data plane to ensure that you're extracting the benefits of installing on Kubernetes uh, if, if, you're, if you're going to head down that particular path. So I think that there's a, uh, I think there's a, uh, line that we need to look at. And sometimes it's okay to say, hey, look, best practices within Kubernetes work just fine. There's nothing extra we have to really push here, but uh, here's, a, here's a gap or, or here's the, the analysis of the application on how an application could better make use of it that is consumable by this particular industry and could be tailored to them. Uh, so there's a there, there may be something in, in, in that respect that, that we can that we can focus on. And also I would like to add uh, to the discussion. Uh, I think this discussion has more value when we're talking about the fabric orchestration, not so much for inside the cluster. I mean, for inside the cluster right now, we have Multus and we have DAM and we have like the primary networking through Calico and all those stuff are working fine, but uh, or NSM. But uh, when uh, everything goes down to the fabric, then we don't have something that we can actually uh, link the application that actually run inside the Kubernetes with the fabric orchestration, with the fabric needs that the application has. So uh, I think the external network orchestration here is more about how we can be sure that we can actually deploy our applications uh, and the applications are gonna be uh, uh, are going to be served correctly from a networking perspective on, on fabric. So that means that if an application needs to have like a, a access to a range of VLANs or to a, raise, a range of VXLAN networks on the fabric, they, 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 should, they should be able to do this on the fly. So we should have an orchestration mechanism that actually configures those VXLAN or VLANs on the fabric and then everything is ready from networking perspective and then the application comes up and it can work normally. I think this is where this external network uh, orchestration phrase comes from. And and just as an extension to to Dimitrios, your comment, uh, I think we mentioned about uh, Wohn's uh, use case that is related to the infrastructure layer and life cycle of that infrastructure object. So I think. I mean, I would classify networks here into like host network and the tenant networks and host networks, we can say like a day zero configuration in, in the networking domain. So when the cluster has to be spun up and all the interface networking that has to be done on the day zero configuration during the life cycle of the cluster, let's say that could be classified into, into that uh, domain. And then comes the tenant networking that will be required by a given network function that will be configured on demand dynamically. And that's what uh, we are kind of targeting with this external network operator. And I agree that 
it could be a bit uh, hard to like understand the external networks here in in what context which we are referring so uh, i try to simplify and try to explain it one of my comments also there that we we are basically take considering the l2 networks that connects the default kubernetes networks or our and our special secondary like we called the secondary pod interfaces to the dc dc edge or the dc gateway and for the external connectivity and that's how we come up with that external network as a term here so uh, are you yeah. suggesting that the operator you're this external network operator doesn't actually do the work itself it just consumes the requirements so, of the so, CNF and passes so it on we, to an upstream? No, so it's it has two facades, like I uh, showed once in the, I can maybe share as well. So it has the plugable architecture for, one second, let me, yeah, I hope. I hope I'm sharing now. So I put it this as a comment as well in, in the discussion. So you can consider this dotted line as uh, the above uh, APIs and the agnostic operator as one facade and the second, the, the bottom part as a second uh, facade architecture. So the, the, the top layer is basically which feed takes the inputs from, let's say, the orchestration layer uh, through the CSAR packages and does the, and that layer basically responsible for the model to model translation because that that's basically has a different nomenclature and it follows, uh, basically it has to uh, make the translation that uh, Kubernetes can understand. So those CRDs will be than in a YAML format, right? So, and that goes into the, this called fabric agnostic operator. And that supports the pluggable uh, architecture for corresponding fabric that we wanted to orchestrate through Eno. Yeah, see, I and, would suggest that that fabric yeah. could not, the, the problem is I don't, if I'm a network operator, I don't want that fabric agnostic operator ever making changes to my network network directly, right? So. If you think about a top of rack switch, that has to be configured before Kubernetes was ever installed, right? That is host all... networking. That's completely fine. Yeah, that has to be done on day zero and that's somebody else responsibility to do the control switch configurations and all, right? I totally agree with that, yeah. What, what, if, what, but... if, what, what if the the CNF requires a different VLAN? Yeah, so for the uh, network separation or for, VPN connectivity we require and we have requirements on, on CNFs that or CNF have the requirement from from the networking point of view to have multiple VLANs and different so that they can segregate their traffics on different VPNs and different networks right, right. and that has to be configured uh, somehow on day, Z, day two day three activities when you have to deploy your network function. And we are trying to orchestrate that through. Yeah, I, I would never, network. I would never want my network function to make those changes to my network. So well, the network yeah, function, that, that well, is, not that directly. That is, that is yeah. Right, but in, in in his drawing, he has him talking directly to the fabric. I'm saying that there should be that plugin is not to the fabric. That plugin is to some northbound operator that owns the physical infrastructure. Well, I, I assume it could be some sort of manager, right? If it's an SDN controller or, or something else, somebody has to own, some component has to manage it, right? Because we're not talking just about day zero or day one, but also day two. Right. Let's right. say you need a network function and it doesn't need that VLAN anymore. So that VLAN should either be deprovisioned or be available for, because these resources are limited too, right? So- right, But it shouldn't yeah, be the yeah. fabric agnostic operator talking directly to the fabric is all I'm saying. It should uh, be talking to no, so it will be, yeah. yeah, so it will be through the plugins, right? So that no, plugin no, but the plugin, and I'm the not talking about the plugin. Yeah. I'm talking about yeah. there's already an external manager that owns those assets, right? Mm. So if I'm talking about, you know, uh, Contrail, 
right? Yeah. There's already a Juno space, which is their EMS instance that owns the state of Contrail, right? And I don't want anything making changes to my overlay or my physical network unless it's going through my Contrail controller. So that plugin wouldn't talk directly to the fabric. It would talk to the controller. Yeah, the that, that, is, yeah. that see, is completely see. fine. That is completely yeah. fine. I mean, if you you can, when we are saying fabric here, if you, if you can see, we also have neutron fabric. I mean, neutron fabric is a virtual fabric. Okay, that you don't talk directly to your right, fabric, the actual that, fabric. You talk to, to you talk to so, neutron. Mm -hmm. That needs, but yeah, right. So that's my point. Here you yeah. just say fabric A. It needs to be very clear that you're not talking yeah. directly to the sometimes, fabric. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes somebody needs. They want to have like a bare metal <clears throat> installation of, of Kubernetes, and they they want to give like access to fabric directly. So, uh, so you want to have access through through your control controller and not talking directly to the fabric, but to your control controller. I don't controller. think you'd ever want to talk. I don't think you'd ever want. I can't think of one scenario where you'd ever want Kubernetes to be owning the configuration of your fabric. That's I mean, it's, it's just an option. So, uh, if, if nobody wants to, to, to create a plugin for uh, to talk directly to the fabric, that's fine. I mean, they have okay, uh, but, possibilities. I think this is exactly why the, the word external came in here, right? That, that's exactly that separation of concerns, right? So it's called external because it's managed externally. <laughs> that's, that's where right, the line is what, wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. That's yeah. not what's shown in the drawing. OK. We can, uh, we so I want to interject something in here, too, because mm -hmm. I, I think, um, A, uh, I think we first need to identify the use cases before we um, talk about like the best way to solve something personally. But like, I don't think we all agree on like external network versus internal network. You keep talking about host level networking, which, um, you know, like we're throwing around a lot of terms. I think that, you know, one of the things we need to think about the next week between now and next Monday's call is some potential terms that we put in discussions and start to add to our glossary. Cause I mean, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't really know the difference when you talk about, you know, these um, network provisions of when you're actually provisioning a network in the sense that you're creating like an L2 domain or an L3 domain that is going to span multiple devices and this and that versus just creating an interface into an existing one, right? Like shared versus um, shared versus external. Like, are we just creating an attachment point, you know, and then to Shane's um, concerns, like, is something like pre-establishing this. Um, once again, too, uh, do we talk about like, there's this concept of like Kubernetes, which is an orchestrator versus the CNF. And we keep using those two things like they're interchangeable. And to me, they're not like, like are we going to allow end workloads to make requests to the infrastructure? Like, and not just like at a low level, like, you know, I want like a kernel interface into a pod type thing, but also like, are we going to allow a CNF to talk to Neutron or NSX or, you know, your VPC directly and request new subnets, new VLANs, this and that? Um, or, you know, do we have you know, something like on the outside, like do we shove it all into Kates or do we allow like the GitOps process to do what it does and Kates is just one endpoint with one interface, you know, managing something that it's good at? Like, I, I really think that we need to clear up some of the terminology start defining the difference between just attaching to a network versus creating a network and then explicitly state what use cases we're going to tackle. Because I'm just listening. I feel like we're talking past each other on a bunch of different topics. I think some people are talking about kernel interfaces. Some people are talking about spinning up virtual networks in their VIM. We keep talking about then what happens when we touch the physical fabric. Do we allow Kates or do we allow um, a CNF to do that? And then once again, there's a difference between Kubernetes making requests versus the end application running in Kubernetes making requests. And I think we need to be succinct about how we delineate that. Yeah, to, to muddy it as well you know, in the internal and then external approach. So what if I spin up a pod that has either OVS or VPP that is exposing a um, some form of an interface or network, which it then uh, terminates and uh, then loads into IPsec to connect to some extra to some uh, to, to some external organization. In that scenario, is that is that pod that is hosting OVS or VPP an internal or an external network in in this respect? 
And so, so I think that the, the terminal, terminology that we have here is, uh, is not well-defined and confusing. And if we could get started on some form of a glossary, that, that would be, to, uh, so that, we can harmonize the terms, that would, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I, that's a great idea. Uh, I, I that. agree that it, it, it's a great idea, I think, Jeffrey. Um, hmm. I think for, it's a little bit ironic that as, as networking people or self-proclaimed <laughs> networking people, we, we keep throwing around the word network, uh, where, uh, <laughs> which is obviously so, so overloaded here. I, I think we really need a very clearly defined glossary that we can all agree with, the adjectives that we associate with network. I personally think the first comment I meant, I thought external is not a very useful adjective, but um, we can find more precise words. We need a lexicon basically for, uh, for network. So, so when we say it, at least within this group, we know what, what we mean exactly. I, I propose we call it a network nomicon. Uh, a monad. Exactly. Yeah. Just, just a last comment. I think there was one comment made by somebody about like, I, okay, we can revisit this figure and yeah, can can explain more precisely and comprehensively uh, uh, where we actually interface and what are the different interfaces. But yeah, there could be, it's, it's not that it, the plugin has to talk directly to the corresponding fabric. And if there is any controller, which is wrapping around that particular fabric A or B. And then that plugin can basically talk to that controller and then eventually does the orchestration or configuring the VLANs in the, in the fabric. Co but, correct. Yeah. And, and I would like also, Alok, sorry for interrupting. I would like to add here that uh, when we are talking about fabric A, fabric B and stuff, we can, we are talking like in a production environment probably is a controller that actually controls the fabric. So the fabric plugin actually talks to the controller that actually controls the fabric. Uh, but for instance, uh, you can have like a, a two VMs that actually run Kubernetes and you have an OVS fabric outside of those VMs that those VMs are connected to. And this is just a dummy fabric. It's, it's just for demo purposes. So the OVS plugin that you have there is just a dummy OVS plugin that actually talks to the OVS dummy fabric that, you that actually those VMs are connected. So in that case, you talk directly to the fabric. So maybe the terminology is, is a bit confusing, but yeah. Well, even, even mm -hmm. the word fabric has to be unpacked a bit. I, there are a few products that are called fabric in the world of SDN, but we might be talking about uh, de facto fabrics that are encapsulated from existing uh, physical functions um, with some sort of management. Uh, that's just saying that's, an, that's another word that I hope we, we really all are talking about the same thing. Yeah, is, is there a use case here as well where the plugin may want to talk directly to a top of rack switch to request a specific configuration on, on a port or to, to configure it in a specific way for maybe some some cost requirements or, or similar? Yeah, maybe maybe you have like a, a, a legacy suite that doesn't have any uh, API and you need just to directly go inside the suites and uh, configure it. So for that reason, you need an, a plugin to actually go directly to the suites, SSH the suites and do the, all the whole configuration, for instance. Uh, we're talking about these kinds of use cases. Maybe this is a use case for somebody, maybe not for us, not for, not for big companies, but for somebody, maybe it is a use case. Oh, yeah, so that, that seems to be an implementation detail, right? That that's not too yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the only reason I bring it up is, is primarily for that gray box on the bottom, so that we're not precluding those type of systems. All right. Um, I've added okay. a discussion, a GitHub discussion for the the lexicon or glossary. So we can start putting stuff in there and then um, do a PR into the repo glossary as, as we have enough information. Um, please try to provide some mapping to GitHub, uh, sorry, to Kubernetes terms. So when we're saying host networking, that has a specific use um, well-known use across Kubernetes. So if we're saying it's common somewhere else, that's fine, but we need to 
we need to match those up what we're talking about so that um, the two communities can collaborate. And then we'll, once we have that, we can get it into the global, um, global glossary and then it can be used in the different use cases. Sure, that's a, that's a good idea. We can, we can go through and prepare some grocery, uh, the terms which we are using in this, in, in this discussion and could help us to harmonize uh, going forward. Yeah. I think maybe one other thing we do too is um, draw like a generic diagram uh, we've said in the past we're not doing reference architectures it's not what i'm stating but like i think we should just have kind of like a legend or a picture that we associate and we stick and get that just shows like a visual representation of the terms that we come up with if we think makes sense you know network attachment point external network host network all these things that we need to like unpack um i think that that might help too it should also be 100 percent like um implementation agnostic like it's not an architecture it's not anything like that it's literally just a picture that shows you know here's a tenant network here's a network attachment you know here's inside the host whatever um i think that that might be useful to people too especially if they're not in these earlier discussions to play like catch up later i don't know if people are if you think that's a good idea, but I think it would be useful to have some type of visual representation of what these images mean and how they tie together to go along with the glossary. Yes, and starting, we should try to always start with or end up with a neutral point of view and then going neutral slash general. So that diagram and the glossary um, usage and the same thing for use cases and best practices. Here's the ones um, I, someone earlier said, I think it might've been you, Frederick. A lot of the app networking applications are, are gonna work fine as any other Kubernetes application. So that's the general best practices. And the diagrams should be similar where we say, Here's the glossary and general applicability. And now here's a separate diagram that shows some of these terms that are more specific would be good. Otherwise we're gonna end up with a, a di one diagram that's a monster. All right, so there's a discussion board and if you wanna add terms or start working on diagrams, then please um, do that. You can paste the diagrams right in. Um, draw IO is suggested for diagrams. It's, um, you can create the SVGs export to pings or whatever and share the link and collaborate like you would do in Google Docs versus um, something external that you have to um, upload the, like a source file for some other drawing program, but whatever you can contribute, it's appreciated. So is there, let's, I guess we can look at some of the other topics, Jeffrey, on the. Yeah, I was about to just yield the floor. Um, I put a comment in a Lokes discussion, um, tagged a bunch of people. So just kind of take this into next week, um, kind of think about some things, think about glossary terms you think we're lacking, we can continue the discussions, et cetera. But um, I think we were probably good for this week and now it's just time to kind of like let stuff stew in our minds for a bit. All right. Let's see if we can run through the, the remaining items then. You wanna pull that up or would you like me to do that? Open uh, if you wouldn't mind I'm getting some some messages I'm trying to respond to at the moment if you wouldn't mind sharing all right yeah sure okay let's see if I can It's, I'm not sure if that's working. I'm looking at the pull request. 
Let's try again. Can y'all see the window? Yes, we can. Okay, so we're going to defer talking about the. It said VUC is not on the call today, so we'll talk about the life cycle next time. And folks can look at the comments. There's been several iterations on this. Um, I opened this a while ago, but it was a draft. This renaming anywhere where it's talking about conformance over to best practice. Um, the proposals, but also just the wording across the board has been done. Um, updated the use cases, the directories, names, and the links and stuff like that. Um, I don't think, oh, let's see. Uh, context and reality check. Um, Bill, are you here? It's only yeah, I'm on the call. Seeing on this. Okay. Just a word change here. Yeah. There's providing context and reality check for CNF best practice proposals. Um, so this is about the relationship between a best practice and use cases. And we keep saying that any best practice proposed needs to relate back to a use case. And what we're trying to move to is best practices that are small, small enough that each one can be combined with others and build up, but they all should relate back to use cases, one or more. I'm good with that wording, reality versus sanity. I think it's um, either way, it's, I'll just take that. Okay. Um, so let's look here. So most of this is word changes like this. So CNF test suite is the focus there. I didn't change everything because there could be something for conformance going forward. So most of it's just right in here, the wording going to, we can, this if we decide later this is too long, fine, but sticking with this name. So CNF best practice proposal, and it's just been updated across all the different places. The templates, the readme refers to it. Um, some typos, and that's it. We only have one approval right now. I think we had two and then asked for an update. We get some plus ones here to merge this or the questions. Comments, objections. Plus one from you, Bill. Yep. Anyone else? I got a few here to merge. Renaming, Hi. moving towards best I'm practice. Good. Okay. All right, anyone else? I'd like to get at least one more. And anyone plus one, merge it today? Happy, happy to it, uh, Frederick. Okay. I'm going to merge it. And I've already merged. Um, I think that was with, and I also had hers in here. I did the changes she wanted. Okay, cool. Let's move on. So 
add values to the charter. This ended up getting split between this and this expanded. Um, the first, it was a very minimal, um, there we go. This very minimal, oh, well, I just got a 404. Well, you can see it here. This very minimal update, this is based on um, some CNCF projects, Kubernetes projects that a list of values, this would go in with the mission and everything else in the charter. And then there was a request to do a lot of expansions. These have been resolved and moved over into a new PR, which builds on that original set. Um, so the first is, can we merge, is there a, a agreement to merge this as a first iteration? Oh, and it looks like we got them. So we got a bunch of, so we're gonna do that now. I didn't know, got those. Okay, so now here's the expanded version. Inclusive is better than exclusive. Go into this, evolution is better than stagnation. These were actually in the last commit versus to improve later. Commit first, improve later. So trying to do quick iterations and not have to get it perfect the first time, which could take a long time. Pragmatism over politics is, is somewhat related to this. Um, going more into, we could have a lot of different ideas, but when we bring a best practice forward, we're not putting a best practice that is not implementable. It's just an idea if we had an amazing system. Um, of course, it can be put forward, but what we're talking about is adoption of best practices that can be used in real world applications and use cases. Focus on community over specific products or companies. So putting the common focus or value as the whole community and how we can benefit and then adherence to the code of conduct. Let's see what we already have, and it looks like we already have um, approval. So enough to merge. I'm gonna do that. And let's see, what do we have? Super Lenter. Did this one get covered? Victor, are you here? You're here, Victor. Yep. So we yeah, have you didn't. zero approvals, but. <laughs> well, just request like a new, because I did uh, revise the latest, the latest changes. So I, mm -hmm. that's why I just request more more uh, reviews. Okay. But uh, that's the, every time that you merge something, I have to revise it because uh, yeah, I need to make sure that it is passing right. everything. We got rid of the line link. Um, there's some other issues. Okay, so we need a new review from folks and then hopefully get this in. And I guess you can resolve the conflicts and then with these updates and then do a yep. review on this one, it will be good. All right. Okay. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Okay, so I think the other two are, we had two different approval processes. Well, one was specific to the PR process that Bill was putting together and there's been some discussion around this one. Um, and this ties into having a set of chairs or tech leads to approve things before they get merged. And this is related to, I think a GitHub discussion that I'd put forward when we were talking months ago, ideas on how we would do this. And we had simple, a little bit more approval and so forth. And then um, I put kind of iterating on, on those ideas and what we were trying to do uh, this acceptance process and then delegation. So this includes both 
the PR process and the um, charter or governance um, uh, items. So on the contributing, I've expanded on it um, based on feedback for what are the different ways to do things. So we're more extensive on here's what you're going to do to create a pull request. So this is specific on changes with pull request. Um, there could be changes via voting somewhere else, but this is pull request stuff. And then um, having some number of reviewers and then acceptance of the PR. And then there was questions about who are the reviewers. So we put this in here based on feedback from Ian and um, a few other people that anyone in the community can be a reviewer and that we want to encourage everyone to do reviews and be able to do that. Any minor change is one reviewer. Majority of other changes right now we're saying five reviewers. This is all in the contributing guide. So there's no, we can update this. We could decide, um, you know, in, in a month that we want more or less reviewers. And then the items, uh, and it says ex except for the items. So except for the items that are in this governance additional approved item list. And that's what is here. So this is under this content approval section and um, this additional item. So this list, so the, the, the items needing approval, the list adding or changing this, the actual charter itself, governance, um, this should say the governance document is what this is pointing to, the link. The code of conduct, so any changes to that. And then the adoption of um, quote unquote approved best practices. So these would be the ones that we, they may go into this guide that Robbie created. Um, but these are the ones where we are saying we have now approved these as ones that we are promoting as best practices for the community and everyone. Um, so once it gets to this point, and this may be a status, it may be, if it's in the document, it counts. It may be that we say your status is now, you could think production. It's production ready, we agree. There could be an earlier list of best practices where we go, these are non-approved, but stuff that we're considering. But that's the, the list and the change and the way to do it. And then everything else is delegated to the community at a, at a less um, allowing it to go through at a, a process that we can change as needed to make it faster is the idea. That's in the contributing guide. All right. So we have a few reviewers and there's uh, been a few, well, there's been quite a few updates, but um, we are at time, so I don't wanna stay in here, but it, and this, these are both very important as far as on the governance side of things. And especially when it comes down to promoting best practices and everything else. So please take a look at these two. And what we'd like to know um, is which direction we wanna go. This one's more defined. And if we want to do that, then it means we need to get tech leads and everything else. And this one is, this one's more focused on allowing us to start working on use cases now and unblocking that. But please take a look, provide some feedback in the in these. And one thing that we need to know is which direction what the community wants to go. Do we wanna go down this path or do we wanna adopt this one for now? And then any specific details. Thanks everyone. See y'all next week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.